Good evening, viewers. I'm Brant Stubblefield. And I'm Christian Franklin. And tonight we're asking the question, what, what saith the, the scriptures? scriptures? Christian, start us off tonight. Well, due to the, the, the logo or the graphic being wrong, we're actually studying out of 1 Chronicles chapter 13 with an emphasis on 1 Chronicles chapter 15, okay. verse 13. Uh, but we want to say real fast, uh, we want to thank the viewers out there. We want to say give a, a lot of appreciation to you guys. Uh, you really have been supportive, very edifying. We've received a lot of very encouraging messages. Uh, you've received a lot of questions uh, for our other broadcasts. And so uh, it's just, it's very humbling to get to be a part of something very uh, impactful and something very, uh, you know, people like to look forward to getting to uh, study from God's Word. And we obviously. enjoy this, don't we? Yeah, course, I always look yeah. forward to our Tuesday and our Thursday and our Sunday evening broadcast at 7 p.m. And Christian, I think that our our broadcast has almost like 700 likes now. Yeah, we're we're almost at 700, and I think about our followers are about 755. And so we want you guys, the audience, to make sure you like the page and also follow the page. Not necessarily just for popularity reasons, but we want to spread awareness of the page and get people uh, noticing. Hey, you know, there's a good yeah. Program it's it's not. It, you made you bring up a good point. It's right. not popularity at all. The yeah. idea of it is is to be evangelistic. Amen. And the more likes and follows that we have, and the more shares, if you'll share this on your page, yes. and obviously, the you know the way that Facebook works, of course, that that's going to increase the distribution of it, and that's right. all free, and you can be a part of that. So we're thankful you're here this evening. Before we start, let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear God and Father in heaven, we're thankful this evening for the broadcast. What said the scriptures? And Father, for our hearts, help us to be humble, our minds to be right. Father, as we teach, let us only teach those things that are true within thy word. Help us, Father, to apply these things to our lives. We pray, Father, for every viewer that's listening tonight, that their ears might be opened, that their heart might be tuned in, and that they might be ready to obey the Lord. Father, forgive us of our sins, in turn as we forgive others. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. So tonight, as Christian mentioned, we're going to be taking a trip back to the Old Testament. There's a couple of passages that I would like to address your attention to this evening, and Christian, explain these passages and kind of what they mean to us. Sure. Well, I was actually thinking of just of Romans 15, okay. verse 4. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so, as we go back to the Old Testament, we realize that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are synonymous. You can't you know, have one without the other. And it helps us understand the Scriptures better. I actually got a question asked to me is how do we know that the scriptures are valid well we know the new testament you know validates what's happening in the old testament and mm -hmm. so on and so forth so we have to have a good educational foundation per se of the old testament to really understand the new testament so that's why i'm excited we get to go back in time back into the old testament and learn uh you know a really a, a story we've probably heard many many times but it's interesting to go back to a story in the old testament and see some new applications that we can make in you know, sure. Our worship and our you know edifying of the Lord today. Uh, I was in, I'll turn to First Corinthians chapter ten verse eleven. Yeah. Uh, and, and while Chris is turning over there, these are two passages that teach us that you know we discussed on previous broadcasts that at the cross, everything, of course, obviously before the cross. Uh, you know, we're talking about Old Testament events. Now, the things that Jesus taught before the Old Testament, they became New Testament doctrine. But we're simply stating that Jesus lived, and the cross is where, Colossians 2.14, when Jesus died, he nailed the Old Testament to the cross. But even though we live under the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9, makes that very clear, we still travel back to the Old Testament, and we become good students of the, of the Bible, the Old Testament, because not only is all scripture given by the inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, we really can't understand the new unless we understand the old. Amen. And Christian, what's this other verse that tells us about the importance of the Old Testament? Well, I like this verse because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so examples. Sure. We, we, give, we are given, uh, you know, with reading through the text, we're given visuals, we're given... Uh, examples of how you know things that you know i'll say this for so you know people did not obey god as they should have and we see the consequences of those actions and so right. uh that's why it's really important that like again we go back to the old testament to look 
to kind of you know correct ourselves too and make sure we're we're aware of that we are really worshiping in spirit and in truth John 4 yes. 24 and so and these uh, examples and admonitions are both positive and negative mm -hmm. the things that we should do the things that we are not to do and remember this even though covenants for example when we refer to the law of Moses as the scripture does John 1 and uh, 17 17 bears that out the law of Moses begins at Mount Sinai mm. and it goes all the way to the cross so for about 1500 years the law of Moses was in vogue it was in existence and men were amenable to it that is the Israelites it was given to the Israelite nation now here's something that we have to remember even though we're not duly under the law of Moses we may go back from time to time to that law so that we understand how God operated with people. Mm. Any principle that is beyond the covenant, in other words, there may be specifics in the covenant, but there may be divine principles that are larger than any covenant that transcend and go to every each and every covenant. For example, God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, God's holiness, the fact that he wants us to obey him. Amen. Those key principles are true in the patriarchal age, that was before the law of Moses. They're true in the Mosaical age, and they're true today. It's only the specifics of the covenant that change. But those transcending attributes that directly connect to the teaching and to the essence of God and his divine nature, those elements transcend covenant theology. And those are those, are those in samples. And that's why we're going to go back tonight, as Christian mentioned, and we're going to look at a particular episode, one of my favorite episodes mm -hmm. in all the Old Testament scripture, that teaches us the importance, Christian, like you said, of obeying God. Obeying God is so important in our lives. And would you like to kind of start us off tonight with the lesson? Sure. Well, let's go to First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 13. I'm okay. going to jump there real fast. Jump to the end. Jump to the end, yeah. And then we'll go back. Okay. But we're, we want to make this point very clear. In First Chronicles chapter 15, and verse 13, the Bible says, For because ye did it not the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. After the due order. So you notice that word because. Mm -hmm. Here is the reason. It's interesting. I've read, well, we're going to go in a moment. First Chronicles 13, which parallels 2 Samuel 6. Yes. Both of those chapters are companion. Uh, same episode retold in two different places. But it's interesting. You can read commentaries and even modern people. And they will wonder and they will express various reasons as to why Uzzah dies in this episode. When the divine teaching of scripture because read it one more time the end we're going to read the end before the beginning that's how i like to read a book by the way i always jump over into the last chapter for that we sought him not after the due order so the reason that they are displeasing unto god and uzzah dies the reason is is because they did not seek god after the due order mm -hmm. the prescribed method the way in which god in heavenly court in the heavenly court prescribed the israelitish nation right. and by the way God does have a prescribed way for each and every person to live. Did you know that? God has prescribed, depending upon what covenant you're in. Mm. We're not under the law of Moses, but we are under the law of Christ. Amen. So we have to figure out what God wants us to do. At the end of the broadcast, we're going to talk about salvation, and we're going to let Jesus give us the due order of the prescribed method of salvation. Amen. But you know, Christian, I was thinking as you start us off this evening, you know, there are passages in the Old Testament that speak concerning the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a small piece of furniture. If you're a Bible student, you already know that. A small piece of furniture. And it had a lid on it. Sure. And it was overlaid with gold. That was the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is where, in symbolism, the Lord Jehovah brought fellowship with the Israelites between the cherubims. He dwelt, and, and that symbolized the fellowship with God between Israel. And this Ark of the Covenant contained some special items, right? Right. It contained the Ten Commandments right. and Aaron's yeah, rod that budded and right. some other things. So this Ark of the Covenant, this special piece of furniture, could only be transported by a specific people. Mm. And it could only be transported in a prescribed method. And so if you have a moment, uh, Christian, read Numbers chapter 4. I would love for our audience to see this before we proceed. Numbers chapter 4, verse number 15. Numbers 4, verse 15, And when Aaron and his sons had made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary as the camp is to set forward, 
After that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. Now notice, of the tribe of Levi, even more specifically of the tribe of Levi, the sons of Kohath mm -hmm. were to be the ones that were to carry yeah. the Ark of the Covenant. And the scripture teaches us in other places that it could only be transported on the shoulders of these men. There would be staves, S-T-A-V-E-S, -E poles that would be placed within these rings and, and these rings, these would be fastened and the Ark of the Covenant would be transported upon the shoulders of the Kohathites, manually carried by humans, divinely prescribed by God of the tribe of Levi of the sons of Kohath. And Christian, that was the due order. Amen. So it was to be transported by human form upon the shoulders, on the staves. And you know, one of the reasons why is because they could not touch holy things. Mm. They were not to touch holy things. No. And they had been warned all throughout the Old Testament, if you touch these holy things, the Ark of the Covenant, then that would bring immediate punishment upon the person. So I think now maybe it's time to start reading 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Let's get into the text. Starting in verse 1, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. In verse 2, And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. Verse 3, And let us bring again the ark of our God to us. We are, we are inquired not at it in the days of Saul. Verse 4, Now, it had been, we passed over a lot of information sure. there. It had been previously captured. The ark of the covenant had been captured at one time by the Philistines. The Ark of the Covenant had lost its way a time or two, not because of God's providential lack of oversight, no. but each and every time because of the Israelites' lack of fervent uh, desire to please God. When we don't please God in our lives, there's always consequences. Amen. Sometimes those consequences are immediate. You know, the Bible says in Galatians that we, if we sow to the flesh, we of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, we of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Sometimes our consequences are in this life. I mean, if I'm driving drunk down the highway... My chances, right, for having a wreck and hurting somebody else or killing myself incrementally increase. If you don't believe that, ask a person that works with statistics with an insurance company. Right. So your, your, your everyday life choices definitely impact even the things that happen here on this earth. Amen. Well, the same principle is true spiritually. We have a soul, Romans chapter 7, the inner man, and what we do in this life determines whether or not we're pleasing to God. And folks, how we live our lives religiously is important. Amen. And so this is interesting here because this special piece of furniture, I was remembering earlier, I think it's, uh, you might check this out, but I believe it's in Numbers chapter 10 and verse number 35. Moses, that great lawgiver of God's people, in the Old Testament, he said, when the Ark of the Covenant was before them, he said, let us rise up. And that came from Psalm later on. Uh, David is going to go back to this and allude to this in Psalm the 68th chapter and make a melody out of it. Let us rise up. The Ark of the Covenant was not only a special piece of furniture, it was considered a holy thing, but it was in symbolism the place where God's fellowship was given to the Israelites. Amen. So as it goes before them, according to Numbers chapter 10 and verse 35, there is, there is that unique, special, holy holiness that surrounds this Ark of the Covenant because again, it is attached to the fellowship of God. Christian, if we don't have fellowship with our God, what do we have? We have nothing. And so, so that's why this evening we're taking an Old Testament event, uh, what we have termed as seeking God after the due order, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 13, or Uzzah and the Ark, right. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and emphasizing from an Old Testament episode that we need to obey God. And when we obey God, there's a blessing. And when we disobey Him, there's a problem. Now listen, David really is a much better king than Saul. David, however, had his problems. I mean, this is another, you know, it's not just David and Bathsheba. Most people recognize his failure with David and Bathsheba as his sexual immorality, right? Right. But this was a failure because David is excited to bring about the cart and, I mean, bring about the Ark of the Covenant. And no doubt he has some good intentions. But he skips over his previous biblical knowledge. And all the people around skip over. And he invents a way that God hath not commanded. So David gets ahead of himself. He does not seek God according to due order. And a failure is immediate in Israel. And it brings about a low state temporarily. And David has to pay a price as a leader. 
because people die in this situation. Sure. We'll continue on in verse 4. And all the congregations said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Before we go on, I want to mention this too. In Judges 21 25, to close out the book, it says, For the people did that which was right in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. That's not what that's saying. This is not saying that the people were just, you know, wanting to be people pleasers. Really, the idea was they had agreed that there was a need to bring the ark of God home. Right. And there was a need to do that. And there's nothing wrong with people getting together, right? I mean, like Nehemiah led people to victory and rebuilding of the wall. Amen. Let us rise up and build. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6, for the people have a mind to work. There's nothing wrong with us getting together and doing things for God. But here's what we have to keep in mind. What we have to keep in mind is, is when we get together to do things for God, that we do it, watch this, according to the, the definite article, the singular, do order. Mm -hmm. To a lot of people, they think that's some legalistic mindset. That's not correct. We must operate according to a thus saith the Lord. There are hundreds of passages sure. that teach us this embedded truth in every dispensation, patriarchal, mosaical, Christian, that we must obey God's word and according to Deuteronomy, we may neither, chapter 4 and verse 2, we may neither add to the word of God nor diminish aught therefrom. Yeah. And on this day, again, David has good intentions. Sure. But as this episode unfolds, we're going to see it pays to obey God. Amen. And when we don't obey God, the consequences sometimes are such mm. that are unbearable and irreversible. And for Uzzah, both of those terms, I believe, are appropriately stated in his case. Amen. In verse 5, so David gathered all Israel together from Shehor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hemath, to bring Ark, God, from Kirjath Jerim. And David went up and all Israel to Bala, that is Kirjath Jerim, Jerim, excuse me, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the Ark of God, the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. Verse 7, and they carried the Ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Say that again. They carried. <laughs> they carried. The ark of God. They carried that holy thing, the ark mm. of the God, that beautiful piece of furniture that had the mercy seat overlaid in gold, the cherubims, wherein, wherein in the middle of that, remember, dwelt that, that beautiful concept of the symbolism of God dwelling among the people. But notice what it says one more time for the viewers out there. I want you to listen to this. Mm. They carried the ark of God, what? In a new cart. Uh-oh. Now listen. This is not wrong because the cart is new. In other words, it's not wrong because it's new. It's wrong because it's unauthorized. Oh, easy there. In other words, Christian may have a new suit. Nothing wrong with a new suit, a new car. Nothing wrong with something being new, but there is something wrong if it's Unauthorized, mm. And that's what the word new there means. It's not necessarily that it's just clean and prestige and neat, right? right? The idea there is the reason God is condemning it is because even though it's new, even though it would seem to be the best, it was unauthorized to begin with. And that's what makes this new cart wrong. You know, there's nothing wrong with building a new church building, quote, a new meeting house. Right. There's nothing wrong with a new suit or a new Bible. But all of those things are authorized things. But if they're unauthorized, it doesn't even matter if they're new, they're still wrong. Amen. So we have an issue here that we need to stop. We've got plenty of time. You just, these the Christian, when you start holding gospel meetings, now this is a place when you get to this text, you just have to camp out for five or ten minutes and go over it and back over it, sure. up and down, sideways, so the people really grasp what this is saying. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 4 earlier and other passages. The Ark of the Covenant was to be transported by whom? The tribe of Levi. Remember, they were the people sanctified and set apart for the religious activity of Israel. Other tribes would go and fight. Read the book of Numbers concerning that. But the Levites, they were a sanctified, set apart tribe. And they had no designated land other than a few remote areas. But cities and so forth that they temporarily had custody of. But basically, they were more reliant and had not the same exact 
possession as the other tribes because they were to be relying upon God totally. Why? And the, the people of the tribes were to supply the tribe of Levi because they alone were to handle the spiritual things of Israel. Amen. To officiate. Right. But more specific in the book of Numbers, not only the Levites or the Levitical uh, tribe, but now the sons of Kohath. Yeah. So David has set aside that, and now he has prescribed this new cart. When the reality was they were supposed to be transported manually on the shoulders or born on the shoulders of these humans, the Levites, the Kohathites more specifically, and they were never to touch the holy thing lest they die. Amen. And they had been warned, they had been taught. Now look, guys and gals, I want you to see this tonight. If there's ever a time in Scripture where in my judgment, you know, in a human standpoint, sure. well, surely God uh, in this situation would understand. Because mm. let's go a little bit further and paraphrase. What actually happens? When they're transporting this ark, what happens? Well, it starts the oxen start to stumble, and then the, the oxen ark, stumbles on the, thresh, the thre threshing floor. Excuse me, and then the ark starts to tip, and then who uh, Uzzah? He reaches up to steady the ark, almost the a ark. natural instinct, right? right? Right. I mean, could you imagine? And you're around the ark of the covenant, and you have been trusted by King David. You know that he's not going to have just anybody on this special occasion. He's got someone trustworthy, and and Uzzah reaches up to grab the ark lest it fall. But they have all forgotten and they have set aside what God said in the due order, 1 Chronicles 15, 13, and substituted his plan for a new cart. And on this special day, although they have good intentions, the anger of God is kindled and it's kindled because mankind has presumptuously, even by Israel's king and leader, David, a great man after God's own heart, who has failed on this day miserably, and later on, he realizes, Christian, that this was a bad bargain. Mm. And this new cart might have been shiny and pretty, but this new cart was an unauthorized transport. You know, I was out the other day, I saw a big semi, I mean big. And they were pulled over. And I could see the expression upon the trucker's face. I, mean, I don't know he got a ticket, but just the expression on his face was like, this is not a good day. And there was two or three troopers around. I mean, they were weighing and they had the scale. They were checking the brake. They were checking the papers. And this was one of those big, big cranes. And I mean, this thing had more axles than, uh, you know, just it was huge. Right. Do you know if you're carrying heavy equipment and you don't have the proper CDL license, you don't have the proper endorsements, you don't have the proper fuel uh, permit sales tax, you don't have the proper uh, registration, you don't have the proper transport if necessary, you have to have the lead and the follow on the oversized permits. If you don't have all of that and you're transporting unauthorized, guess what? You're going to pay a fine because the government doesn't allow that. So take that illustration and go one million magnified. God says, this is the Ark of the Covenant that in symbolism, I dwell, I dwell with my people. It encased the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. Think of the, just of the grand holiness that attached to this thing. And why on earth would David think he can transport it with good intentions in an unauthorized way? Christian, are there people today that have good intentions but that are doing things religiously unauthorized? Well, that's what I was thinking too. You know, if, if any man speaks, let him speak of the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, verse 11. Okay. And that has a very heavy meaning to it. The oracles of God is what God has told us specifically. I think specificity is key. I can understand where there can be some things that are harder to understand, 2 Peter 3, and verse 16. Yes. But what God has given us, since he's not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, he's given us what he wants. And so we have to do our best. And I understand there are people out there that say, kind of like bringing up what you brought up, the, well, you know, God's going to understand, you know, it, it's, it, 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 we're trying to modernize, you know, worship in, in, a, in, a, in a human sure. sense, you know, a secular sense. We're trying to modernize things. We're trying to, we don't mean to deviate far from the word, but we, we understand that God's still going to, God's going to be like, hey, you know, you're, you're worshiping me. Uh, that's, that's all that matters. But see, you know, I, I was actually thinking, I don't want to jump too far back, but I think about Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And uh, 
Now we all know the story about the sons of Aaron, the high priest, Nadab and Abihu. And so basically what happens is they build an altar. They do almost everything correctly except there's one thing. They have a strange fire. The King James says a strange. Another synonym for that would be an alien fire. And I'm not talking about UFOs. I'm talking about an alien, something that's not... It's foreign. God, yeah, it's foreign. You know, God did not specifically unauthorized and authorized. King exactly James says, there. which He commanded them not. So when God hasn't spoken on a subject and we presumptuously engage, right. then according to Leviticus ten one and two and First Chronicles chapter fifteen, verse thirteen, God's divine commentary upon the subject: We sought Him not according, David said, to the due order. And what's sad is, you know, in verse two. When they had that strange fire in that worship, God devoured them with it. Yes. On both of these occasions, we have something in common, Christian. We do. Uzzah loses his life. Mm. And on this occasion, people lose their life. Amen. So this is a very tragic event. Now, let's look further here at this text concerning situational ethics. A lot of people think that, that you know, again, that, that God is going to excuse our misbehavior as long as our intent is good. Mm -hmm. And I think these passages prove to us, even though David no doubt had a good intent to please God, right. he did not stop long enough and pause to remember his Bible study earlier of the oracles of God and to go ahead and proceed with God's authority and blessing. And so not, God is not going to, according to Titus, I believe it's chapter uh, 1, verse 2, the Bible says God who cannot lie. God does not lie. No. His will, his royal decree, his divine teaching is not going to waver. It's not going to waver by taking heaven from someone who is saved. And it's not going to take hell away from someone who is without the gospel to be punished. Mm. So both ways, positive and negative, God's will is God's will. Right. What we need to do is learn God's will. God is a good God. God is a faithful God. Yes. God wants us to worship him, to love him, and to go to heaven when this life is over. But God is not going to allow us to substitute a new cart in an unauthorized manner and transport a physical object in the Old Testament, this holy thing, without his disapproval. And today, remember Romans 15, 4, we're supposed to be learning about the things that are written before time so that we today can receive comfort and strength. Well, today in our worship, Christian, God has been very specific. Sure. Remember John chapter 4 and verse number 22 through 24, God teaches us that we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. God prescribed us a divine order. And this Old Testament episode teaches me tonight that I'm going to be more serious than I've ever been about making sure that when I'm engaged in worship or religious spiritual activity, that I want to do it to be pleasing to God. I want to have my heart totally in love with God, and I want to do that which pleases Him. Amen. I was thinking about Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. It says, There may be a way that seemeth right unto a man, mm -hmm. but in the end thereof those ways lead into death. And so we have to remember that if we are, if we are going by emotion, and I'm talking about the heart down here, we're not going by the heart up here. I know we like to reiterate it's up here with our intellect, with our yes. uh, with our studying to show thyself approved. The God's word uh, is it, true. It's it's you know it has given us everything. It's that due order mm -hmm. of what we're supposed to be doing. So and you know what? Yeah, it brings so much joy to our life. Amen. Do you know obeying God is where you find joy? The joy of the Lord and the strength of the Lord, according to the book of Nehemiah, when we, when we serve God and when we obey God, there is a great joy in that. Obedience is not dead. Obedience is not a lack of heart. Here's what I want our young people to see. It's not something that's, quote, dead in the water, some old school mentality that's dying out. Obedience is the God. Obedience to God is the way to salvation. Amen. According to Hebrews chapter 12, Christ is what is the author, the author uh, and the finisher of our salvation. And to those that obey him. Mm. But not only is obedience the way to heaven, Revelation 22, 14, blessed are they that do his will and enter into gates to the city and keep his commandments, etc. But not only that, Christian, but obedience is heartfelt. That's Amen. how you express your love to God. Romans 6 and 17, obey from the heart, that form of doctrine. God has always been concerned about the hearts of men and the hearts of men manifest love by and through obedience. And so when we obey God, it's, you know, we are shouting, I love you through our obedience to him. Amen. Because obedience in this episode was not had. And by the way, I thought of earlier, wonder where they got this, where did they get this from? 
Where did, they, where did David get the idea of a new cart? Could it have been the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 6? Sometimes what we do, Christian, is we look out in the religious world and we see other people doing things. Remember when the Israelites, remember when they, they looked around and they said, oh, everybody else has a king. We want a king. Mm. Samuel was upset, and I'm paraphrasing, but, but God said, oh, Samuel, you know, tell them what's going to happen if we, they have a king, that their sons are going to go to war, that they're going to be taxed on their lands, and a lot of things are going to happen. And God said, Samuel, he, I'm not displeased with you. And the Bible says God gave them a king in his anger and took him away in his wrath. But the people wanted a king because every other yeah. tribe around and every other nation had a king. Sometimes people, even the church, they want something so bad they can't stand it because everybody else has it. We don't need things because other people have them. We don't need a new cart because the Philistines have one. 1 Samuel 6 verse 7. What we need is, we need the old, the old truth that is 2,000 years old, the gospel we need the way of Jerusalem. We need the New Testament church. Amen. We need the acts of the apostles. We need the five acts of worship. We need those things that God wants us to have. Amen. I was even thinking in Acts 2.42, you know, being steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. We have that apostles' doctrine. We're being steadfast in breaking of bread, having the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. We are fervent in prayer. I mean, that's what we need. Amen. You know Acts 2.42, they continue steadfastly in John 14.15. If Amen. you love me, keep my commandments. commandments. And so, folks, obedience is not dead, it's not dry, it's not crusty. I'm telling you what's sad, and what's displeasing, what's shattering, what's heartbreaking is when people like David who knew better, David knew better, who overall, he was a great man. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Amen. Had his immoral affair with Bathsheba. Cost him a lot. Cost him his own son. Cost him many other things, too. But on this day, he lost a lot of respect in the eyes of God temporarily because David failed on this day to act as a good king and to lead his people according to the word of God. Preachers, elders, deacons, fathers and husbands tonight. When we do not as a people, as leaders of our homes, when we do not set forth the due order, we're failing our homes. We are failing our homes. It's not the wives and the children that lead the homes. Sometimes the wives and the children may not always agree, Christian. You're not married yet, you don't have to learn that. But, but children, it, it's okay for children to be upset. Sure. Children are not to lead the home. The husbands are to lead the home. And listen here, men. The men must make sure that they're not allowing the, quote, new cart or the unauthorized activity. We are to make sure that we're going to transport the way God says transport. Amen. And we come to the New Testament. That's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Go ahead and start in verse 9. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Chedon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Verse 10. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. So good intentions, the situation itself, emotions, um, none of the, the circumstances of the day, the impromptu movement, the natural seemingly reaction, none of those things changed the mind or will of God. No. Folks, if God's mind was not changed in that day concerning the actions of Uzzah, why would his mind be changed today with the covenant he has given us? It is important to obey God. Keep on. Verse 11. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was displeased. But you know, there are various feelings when we displease God. When we displease God, often we can become displeased. Mm. Now, if you'll notice, as we read on the text, David, uh, he basically stops for a moment and hesitates so he can gather his thoughts. Keep reading. Verse 12, And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? I'd be afraid of God too if I had seen and understood what had just happened. Mm. Here's what's sad. David, in some sense, is responsible for this man's death. Our actions as preachers, elders, fathers, husbands, all of us as Christians at large, our actions do cause things to occur. And it's true, Ezekiel 18, 20, that the son does not inherit the sin of the father. That's true. That you don't stand in judgment for me and I don't stand for you. But it's also the case, folks, that my actions affect you and your actions affect me, especially when I'm in leadership position. So David as a leader failed and his actions 
or lack of following God's will had a part in this this day. David was displeased and David, no doubt, was afraid of God. We ought to have more trembling today in the presence of God because, folks, we do serve a joyful and a, a, a wonderful God that saves us and, and loves us. But we also serve a God who Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. He's a consuming fire, the text says. Hebrews 12, 29. Hebrews 12, 12 29. Yeah. Let's keep reading. Verse 13, so David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom and Gittite. And I read a little bit on that this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And when we read on over uh, in the book, we will learn that he is a singer and that he's with the Levites. In other words, all of a sudden now David's interesting in going by the book. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to have, he's going to make sure the one that carries it even uh, slightly to transport it on the shoulders in the correct way that he's an authorized fellow. Go ahead. Verse 14, And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom and his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. God blesses us when we do his will. Now, the next, so it's like he, he waits a while to gather his thoughts. He, he has it transported prop, properly. They're blessed for doing it. But now what happens? Now it, it says, in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Now let's go over and read one more time, Christian. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 13. This is the reason. And by the way, later on, the ark is transported properly. Right. David uh, understands he did wrong and he corrects himself and moves on. That's what we should do when we make mistakes. But we should avoid mistakes like this as much as possible because these mistakes are costly. Mm -hmm. Somebody died that day. First Chronicles 15, 13, what does the Bible say? For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us for that we sought him not after the due order. We sought him not after the due order. As we close tonight, Christian, you know, we always, you and I agree on this. When we close any episode, we, we made application from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We've gone through the text. We always want to take it where? Straight to salvation. Amen. Because if you, the viewer, are not right with God, then nothing else matters in our studies. That's the first and primary question we ask every episode. Are you right with God? Are you ready and prepared to meet the Lord in judgment? Amos 4.12. Are you ready with confidence looking for him a second time without sin into salvation when he comes in the clouds, Hebrews 9 and 28. So tonight, I want you to think about this. Think about the Old Testament, as we said, Romans 15, 4, we learn from the Old Testament. David, and I'm going to put due order. David was displeased. David recognized God's anger. Uzzah was killed that day because David did not seek God according to the due order. Due order is the, the way in which God hath decreed. Now what I want to do now, Christian, let's turn and read Mark chapter 16, verse number 15 and 16. And I want you at home tonight to look at the order that Jesus talks about salvation. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Preach the gospel. One cannot be saved. One would not even know what to believe in if he did not hear mm. the gospel. So preaching the gospel, that's our charge. That's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Right. As evangelists, preaching the gospel. But then... Then if we're preaching the gospel, what does that mean other people are to be doing? Believing. Yes, and they're to be hearing. Oh, hearing, right. Hearing the gospel. Romans 10, 17. Romans 10 and 17. Yeah. But after, after they hear the gospel, what should that propel them into? That propels them into believing. Yeah. Into believing. And what should that propel them into? Well, you believe and then you repent. Oh, you be, okay, well. <laughs> you Mark 16. Mark 16, you're right. And it's true, repentance, we'll get there in a moment, but sure. we're just going by what Jesus said specifically. Right. Preach the gospel. That implies one must hear the gospel. One must believe that gospel and be baptized. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to equal salvation. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit on the edge. Yeah, Nemo yeah. can go that far or not, if you can get all that in the screen or not. Now, I want you to concentrate on this at home. 
Preach the gospel. Why? Because the finished work of Calvary has been done. Jesus cried in John the 19th chapter, it is finished. His work on earth was finished from his virgin birth, his incarnation, God in the flesh dwelling with us, John 1 and 14, to his boyhood in Luke 2 and 52 at the age of 12, to his baptism at about 30, the measure of the Spirit, in other words, he had the Spirit without measure, John the third chapter. At his baptism, he was given great power according to Acts 10 and 38 through 45. And in that baptism, that marked the beginning of his, quote, personal ministry. And through the miraculous feats and his teaching, many, many people were taught of Christ himself. And ultimately, he was led, he was led, as Isaiah 53 says, to a sheep before the slaughterhouse. In his humility, I mean, his entire, everything he had was taken from him, Christian, mm. so that he might give himself to us. Second Corinthians 8 and 9, he who is rich became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. And Christian, on this day, when he came to the cross of Calvary, a horrible, horrible day, Yet a great day, a great day for the sins of the world to be forgiven, those that come to Christ. A horrible day because they crucified my Lord and horrendously caused him torture and pain. But at the cross, the finished work of Calvary was done because after the burial and the glorious resurrection, the gospel now according to the scriptures has been fulfilled. Satan, Satan has been cast aside. In that sense, salvation is given to the world. And as the gospel is preached, men who hear that saving message believe in the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. They're baptized. They reenact the gospel. They reenact the gospel. And then they're saved. Notice the due order. Give us the due order, Christian, simplified. Sure. We have hearing the word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that propels someone to believe. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. And then they, uh, I believe, repent. We'll get to, get to that now. But Luke chapter 13, verse 3, you shall repent. You know, you repent, you shall likewise perish. And then confession. So we have confession. We have Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. We have Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. If you confess me before men, I confess you before my Father. And then ultimately, one is baptized. And so... All of these steps are crucial, they're essential. But the actual, we have, yeah, Mark 16, 16, but the actual act itself of baptism is the one that remisses us of sins and actually puts us into the church, into the kingdom of God. There's five steps of salvation according to what Christian mentioned. But Mark 16 summarizes it in this way. This is what I want us to see tonight. This is the order. And here is, here's why. This order is reduced in this concept. If you trust God and obey him, you will be saved. Did you know that was true in any dispensation? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. But notice Genesis chapter 6 verse 22. Noah did all God commanded him, so did he. He trusted in God. He obeyed God. What was the outcome? He was saved. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 20, along with seven other people, a few, that is eight souls were saved by water. The like figure wherein to... Even now, baptism does save us. Why did Jesus put baptism on this side of salvation? Here's why. Because you can't be saved without the gospel. Amen. You cannot be saved without the gospel. It is the power. There's the power, folks. Amen. Not us. It's the gospel. It's the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. But unless you believe in that and you reenact that, you have no way to contact that. That's how you contact the gospel in baptism. And when you believe in it, and you contact it through baptism, guess what happens? Guess what happens, Nemo? You're saved. I remember when we was trying to convert Nemo, remember that? Mm -hmm. it took a long time. But, but <laughs> because people don't say, well, I have been baptized. Wait a minute. You have to understand the due order. Baptism is on this side of salvation. Amen. In other words, you're not saved until you've been baptized. Some people believe if you believe you're saved, mm. and then later on you're baptized. No, 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 no. Remember David the new cart? Can't have the new cart because not authorized. You have to have the right order. And here's why, Christian, again, it's all about the gospel, believing it and reenacting it. Now, Christian was alluding, and he's perfectly correct earlier. I got to jump the gun there, but... <laughs> no, you're, you're right. And some people are confused. Say, well, why in Mark 16 does it say belief and sure. baptism equals salvation? But now you said earlier repentance and confession, you start naming up all these things. Here's why. Because in this passage, Jesus is just summarizing it. 
we sing the song, trust and obey, for there is no other way. Trust and obey is belief and baptism. And he's just summarizing it. Some passages will emphasize one aspect, other passages will emphasize another aspect. But here's the beauty of, here's the, beauty of the New Testament. All passages will harmonize and they will always be in the same order. Amen. Let's look at Acts 2 and 38 tonight, briefly. Since you mentioned repentance earlier. Sure. The question has been asked in verse 7, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now what's just the text? What were they told to do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. For what reason? For the remission of sins. For or equals remission of sins. Now remember what we just studied. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. Look at this. Repent and be baptized. And that equals remission of sins. Why? Because we want to please God according to the due order. Don't be driving a new car, folks. Learn from David. Due order. So it's not that these passages contradict, Christian. No. They supplement. Amen. And they harmonize. And the truth is, when you study all the New Testament, here's what you're going to come to an understanding of. When you hear that saving gospel of Jesus Christ, it must result in evidence and absolute belief. As you quoted John 8 and 24 earlier, unless you believe that I'm he, you'll die in your sins. Then you're led to repentance, which requires an absolute change within the heart, a change of direction, a change of mindset, a, a regret of the past, and a movement towards the future, etc. And this change begins to facilitate a mindset that leads not only one to confess Acts 8 and 37, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but he's not only willing to confess his name, he's willing to be baptized in his name. That's Acts chapter 10, verse 48. They were commanded to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 2 and 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And his name is his what? Authority. His authority. You see that? That's why we do it by due order. Amen. By heaven's decree. By heaven's authority. And I know there's somebody out there. Not a Christian. I just know there's somebody out there that probably has never heard or doesn't, doesn't have a complete grasp on salvation. And sure. would you be willing to go, even if they asked, and do a personal Bible study with that person? Oh, amen. And we want to, I think all the viewers out there can agree that we have this, the Bible, as the ultimate authority. I know that a way that seemeth right unto a man can lead unto death. And so man can say how you are saved, but the Bible says it right here. The Bible has given us, you know, the word, the due order of how someone can be saved, added to the church, Acts 2, 47, translated into that kingdom, Colossians 1, 13. We can go on and on. And ultimately, who would not want to be a Christian to have all of those spiritual blessings that are listed in Ephesians Man. chapter 1, starting verse 3? What a blessing. Right. Folks, to obey God is better than sacrifice, the Amen. Bible teaches. Tonight, will you obey God? Obey God in salvation. Obey Him from the heart, Romans 6, 17. Obey Him according to the due order, 1 Chronicles 15, 13. Obey Him in the words of Jesus and the words of the apostle Peter. Belief plus baptism equals salvation, Jesus said, Mark 16, 16. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. All of God's teachings harmonize, they supplement, and never contradict. We're praying for you and we're hoping that you would legitimately begin a study of the New Testament and see what God's word actually says. You know how an onion, you got to peel off that outside to get to the part that you really... Studying the Bible is kind of like that. Sure. You've got to really peel back in your mind a lot of biases and prejudices that have come over the years and to get down to the place where you can start extracting. It's like a well, this just deep spring of water that's going to come forth. And folks, it is a life-giving message, but you have to give it time and you have to give it an understanding from your honest heart. The only soil that I'm aware of in Luke, the eighth chapter, that brought forth producing fruit was the good and honest heart. Amen. So the problem is never the seed. The seed, Luke 8, 11, is the word of God. Amen. The problem not the, is the same seed that's cast all over the globe. Then why are some people willing to obey it and some willing not? Ultimately, it depends upon the heart. That's why one of my favorite passages we close tonight is in Ezra chapter 7 and verse number 10. Ezra, who was a scribe, Ezra prepared in his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it 
and to teach in Israel all of its statutes and commandments. May we, like Ezra of old, condition our hearts to be a divine, to be a, excuse me, a receiving chamber mm. for God's divine and eternal truths. Amen. Christian, I, do you have any words of encouragement as we close tonight? Well, you know, something, it's just kind of a surface level thought here, and the audience can agree with this, that so many people try to mold the word of God into what they want okay. or what they think. But we should be molding ourselves to the word. We should, you know, Think about Psalm 119, verse 160. It says, Thy word is true from the beginning. It's from beginning to end. The divine Amen. revelation we've been presented is true. We don't have to question it. We don't have to, you know, nitpick at it. To, you know, we have to study it, of course, but not try to criticize it, right? It's, it, we, we've got it right here. And that's the beautiful thing is that we have that, uh, we have that due order put in front of us. And so we just want the viewers to know that we always want to, you know, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Amen. Workmen that needed not to be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth. To divide, to really define that due order that we've been talking about, First Chronicles 15, verse 13. And one last point before we close, I forgot to mention sure. tonight. I've noticed on the thread a lot of people in various places that I'm familiar with, and I think you are as well, that are members of the Church of Christ, mm. but for some reason or another have fallen away. If you're watching this broadcast and you're a member of the Lord's kingdom and you've fallen away, please message us after the broadcast tonight. Amen. Let us help you get back on that straight and narrow path. Life is too short. Eternity is too near. And you are too precious to waste your life. The Bible says it's better not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it to turn your back upon it. For this proverb is true. The sows will turn the wall into the mire and the dog into the vomit. Please. Come home like the prodigal yeah. son. Come home and the father will anticipate and, and receive you with open arms once you repent and come home. Yeah. Come home, any member of the church of Christ that's gone astray. And Christians, we close tonight. It's the same every evening. Everybody ought to be asking one particular question. What, what saith the, the scriptures? scriptures? Long I have been waiting, and so fondly contemplating, fondly my sweet home awaiting by and by.